came today to visit the captain of our team, uh, His Excellency, the President of our great country, President Mohammed Buhari. Um, I had not had the privilege of having a one-on-one -on -one with him because obviously of the situation that has um, affected all of us, the pandemic. And I thought it was important for me to brief him on what and how we're doing in Ogun State. And that we have encapsulated in this book, which I came to present the first copy of it to the president. And the book, here it is. It's 52 weeks, our first 52 weeks in office. It says, 52 weeks of our building a future together. From May 29, 2019 to May 29, 2020. This book encapsulates everything we did in our first one year. I shared all that we've done with the president. Like I said, the first copy that rolled off the mint, I wanted to ensure that I gave the president the first copy. We did not have the opportunity to do an elaborate presentation of what we did because of the pandemic, so we decided to reduce everything into print. Um, on the back side of the book, you'll see what we call our pillars, our four pillars, encapsulated by the acronym ISHEA. ISHEA, I for infrastructure, S for social well-being and welfare, E for education, Y for youth empowerment and job creation, and A for agriculture. That is what Ishaya. So when we say Omo Ishaya, it's also an acronym for what we've done. So basically, I took the president through the book. He was quite excited. Um, he commented the fact that I had a way of reducing what I've done into print, because I believe that it gives and provides for a memorable read. You know, uh, He promised me that he was going to go through it page by page. In our first 100 days in, in office, we laid the foundation of our Ishaya program. And I believe that is what has helped us, such that by the time the pandemic came in, we were able to build on that foundation that we had established in our first 100 days. On the I front, which is I for infrastructure, um, we've done quite a bit. And when you think of the fact that Ugu State is called the gateway state, it's a gateway state for a reason. And that reason is very simple. We are that state that provides a gateway to Lagos. Lagos is the fifth largest economy on this continent. You cannot go between Lagos and the rest of the country without going through Ogun State. So we are the gateway state to Lagos, we are the gateway state to the rest of the country between Lagos and, and the rest of the country. So we see ourselves as what we call that expansion corridor for Lagos. We also see ourselves as a state that facilitates movement between Lagos and the interland. Being an expansion corridor for Lagos requires that we provide the right infrastructure to allow people to come between Lagos and our state and to go back. So you find that the people that come to live in Ogun and work in Ogun, the people that come to live in Ogun and work in Lagos. And that calls for us to ensure that we have the right an adequate infrastructure to address that. Because of that, one of the first things we did was we awarded the contract of the Ekpe Jabode Road, which now makes it easier and will make it much easier when completed for people who live in the Lekki Axis going to the east. They don't have to go through the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, which is being reconstructed right now. But even at that, it would not have the capacity to carry the amount of traffic that would be envisaged, you know, that goes between Lagos, Ibadan, and the north. That road is the most busiest road in this country. So we began by intervening on the Lagos um, uh, Ijebude road, which now would evacuate people coming from the east, going to Lagos, or people coming from Lekki, you know, going to, going to the east. And also opens that corridor up for industrial activity, knowing fully well that there's a new Lekki port coming up, there's a Dangote refinery. So that whole corridor now becomes an industrial corridor as well. We looked at other areas that we needed to intervene in, particularly our township roads. We enumerated the roads that are 
that meet our tests, our eligibility tests, test of impact, you know, test of visibility, test of economic importance. And we chose those rules across the length and breadth of Ogun State. And I'm proud to say that in our first one year, we had inter intervened in almost 90 kilometers of roads, out of which we had completed over 22 kilometers of those roads, and they are ongoing. We are now going to our next phase of roads. These are roads that are internal roads, border roads that link us between us and other states, and roads that go to particular places, either that are hospitals or uh, educational uh, institutions, and so on and so forth. On the, on the um, uh, social well-being and welfare front, we have housing, we have health care, um, we have um, uh, the issue of you know, women's uh, empowerment. So what did we do? Um, luckily, or unluckily for us, the first case of COVID-19 was in Ogun State, you remember? And we took that as a warning, and we immediately began to, to work ahead. Uh, that index case um, uh, was eventually you know, treated in Lagos, and he recovered. But that was what allowed us to have the lead on our solution centers. We built an solution center in Shagamu. We converted a model school into one in Ikene. And I mean, to date, I think we've done you know, pretty well in the handling of our COVID. But in terms of the economic sustainability, you know, in dealing with the issue of, of the pandemic, we had begun to prioritize the issue of affordable housing. And in view of the pandemic, we now you know, fast track that because we saw our housing program as an opportunity to also empower our youth. So we began to build houses, and in our first hundred the first one year, we had built about 130 of the first 500 you know, unit, affordable housing unit. These houses have been sold for between five and six million naira, and they were all built by direct labor. We, um, you'll see them in this book. I'm going to leave a copy with you here. But the most important thing is, it has allowed us to empower our youths, the artisans, your carpenters, your bricklayers, your masons, you know, Everything that they used for those houses were built on site. Now we are fast forwarding. We are planning to build another 1,870 of those houses across the length and breadth of the state. It is part of our economic you know, uh, uh, sustainability plan you know, to take us out of the economic crisis that the pandemic has caused you know, uh, us in Ogun State. So we're building affordable houses in the three central districts. We're looking at about 2,000 between now and May next year, and that has started, and that is also going by, by direct labor. In the area of education, we've also intervened at the basic education level. We are rehabilitating schools across the breadth of the state. To date, we've probably done in the excess of about probably maybe 300 and something schools. All the schools are wearing a new look. If you see our schools, you'll see them. They have yellow roofs there. I mean, they are, because we believe that that is when we need to intervene. Ogun State is the education capital of this country. We have more secondary schools than any other state. We have more universities than any other state. Ogun State was the birthplace of free education. So in the area of education, we've also intervened. Um, in the area of youth empowerment and job creation, you recall that last time I came, I shared with you that we were able to launch our Uncle Boras program against the backdrop of our job portal that we launched in our first 100 days. Our job portal allowed us to enumerate how many people do we have employed, unemployed, underemployed in Ogun State? In the first one month of that job portal, we recorded over 150,000 people. So we are, at least we're able to dimension how many people we have that are either underemployed or unemployed. And from that job portal, we began to harvest those that wanted to work, you know, be artisans, those that wanted to go to TVET, technical vocational and educational training, those that wanted to go into agriculture. And we even made sure that the industries in Ogun State, knowing fully well that Ogun State is the industrial capital of this country, are also posting their job availability on our job portal. So we launched our Anchor Bros program through the support of the Central Bank, an initiative of Mr. President, and that's been very successful. I'd like to share with you, for those that don't know that, we began planting rice in March, shortly after the COVID struck. And two weeks ago, we were harvesting our first batch of rice that was planted during the COVID. And this was done in collaboration with our youths. The youths were given different sizes of parcels of land. You know, they were given all the inputs. They were supported. 
and we are harvesting that rice as we speak. And that is being expanded. So these are some of the things that we've done between job, uh, youth empowerment and job creation, agriculture. We have so many initiatives that we've done. So basically what I came to do was to take Mr. President through this thing that, these things that we've done in our first 52 weeks. And I'm happy to say that he was, he was very impressed and he said to me that he will go through this book page by page and, and, and thank me for doing that. On, 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 on another note, I also came to share with the president some of the pains that we're going through and are going, that we're going through in the state. Our biggest industrial hub in this country is the Agbara Industrial Estate. There's a road that goes from Agbara to Lusada to Atan. That road is a road that leads to this Agbara Estate. That road is in such a deplorable state that trailers that are coming from the port, taking goods that need to be processed and finished to this industrial estate, Trailers that are taking finished goods from that industrial estate to the rest of the country or back for export continue to have accidents you know, and delays to the point where some of the multinationals are threatening to actually leave the country and go to another country. So I came with a letter advising and requesting Mr. President to note that because our people do not understand the difference between a federal road and a state road, this road has continued to become an embarrassment, not just to us in Ogun State, but the entire country. This place is important to us for the economic survival of our state and the country at large. We have decided to intervene in this road ourselves as a state. I want Mr. President to know that we are going to have to construct that road at our expense, and I want him to inform the Federal Ministry of Works that we will be doing so, and we will also be making demands on them for a full refund of the construction of that road. So that I shared with him. I also shared with him the pains of the Lagos uh, Otabe Guta Road as well. I came with um, a letter that I had written uh, sometime earlier on and pictures to show the deplorable state of these roads. These are roads, Lagos Otabe Guta Road is this, probably the second busiest road in this country. These roads are in such deplorable condition. And we understand that the federal government cannot afford to build all the roads at the same time. But as a state government, the Lagos state government and I have written to Mr. President, ask Mr. President, to transfer that road to us. It's a commercial road, and we will commercialize it so that we can take that burden off the federal government. And I'm glad to say that Mr. President was very pleased with these uh, discussions and these applications, and he's promised to see what he will do to give us the necessary support so that you know, this can also help us in the economic upliftment of, of, of our, of our uh, region. So this is why I came to see Mr. President. Let me first say to you that Mr. President is so meticulous, he's so methodical, is extremely organized. And at any point in time, any governor wants to see the president, all you have to do is ask. And the president will give you audience. He will give you audience, he will take notes. And for those of us that know the president, he's someone who believes in constituted authority. So when a governor says, these are my problems, the president takes it to heart and he follows through with it. One cannot ask for a better captain of our ship. That is what I have seen in Mr. President, and that is what I probably think that most people will not know because Mr. President is not a man of many words. Well, thank you very much for another very good question. Thank you for reminding me. Um, the reason why I probably did not talk about that security was because I sat down here sometime in the past and I had you know, shared with you what I've done on security. I'm trying to flip the pages of this book to see perhaps if I can quickly show you um, pictures of what we did in terms of security. Let me first say that in the area of security, I must thank Mr. President for the support he gave us. As soon as uh, we assumed office, um, and I'm glad to show you this page. This is a page showing the area of security. Um, which is, of course, under the social well-being and welfare of uh, our pillars, Ishaya. Um, these pictures were taken when the Inspector General of Police came to Ogun State to formally receive and commission the 100 pickup vehicles that we bought for the police. We have 200 motorcycles that we bought. And for the first time in a long time in Ogun State, the communication equipment that we also had acquired that now allows our entire security architecture to communicate with each other, meaning that the police can communicate with the military, can communicate with the SSS, they can communicate with the civil defense. 
the CP can communicate with his DPOs and the area commanders without having to use a cell phone. Um, when I assumed office in Ogun State, that did not exist. And you will see a picture of a helicopter there. And that helicopter was given to us by Mr. President to allow us to quickly and rapidly respond to kidnap situations that were a test to our will when we assumed office. So what did we do? On assumption of office, we looked at the security trust fund as it existed, and we realized it didn't have the right governance uh, 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 structure. So we tweaked that law, we sent it to the House of Assembly, it was passed. We set up that fund, the chairman of that trust fund was the chairman of one of the biggest industrial companies in the state. The directors on that, on that fund are executive directors of different financial institutions. I brought in um, uh, the executive secretary who has served on a similar fund, the security trust fund in Lagos State for so many years, Okoyemi Agbaje, he's the executive secretary of that trust fund. We raised money, we acquired all this equipment, Mr. President complimented our efforts by providing this helicopter for us because we had a few kidnapped situations and we realized that the way to resolve them was once the distress call comes in, we must be able to quickly narrow down that point where the calls are coming from and, you know, and immediately track the kidnappers. And that was what we did. We used the combination of our vigilantes, you know, our palm mine tappers, uh, our hunters, our policemen, all the law enforcement agencies, um, calls will come in, the helicopter will be dispatched, will be hovering around so that the kidnappers are not able to leave that immediate you know, corridor and then you know, the law enforcement agencies will move in. Um, I believe that um, that has sincerely you know, has, uh, successfully paid, paid off. A crime in Ogun State has, um, uh, is at its all-time low at the, at the present time. During the pandemic, there were a few tests again. Some people are trying to take advantage of the lockdown. They tried to you know, do a few things, which I'm sure you remember. But um, you know, through the support of the Inspector General of Police and uh, my uh, uh, security architecture in Ogun State, we clamped down on them. And today, Ogun State, we, we don't have any room for any criminals. Um, only last week, um, you recall that we had a case of a serial killer in um, Ikene local government that had been tormenting our people. He would come out, he would kill people who would run through the bush. Um, through the efforts of uh, my commissioner of police and you know, other law enforcement uh, agencies, he was tracked, and in the process of arresting him, um, 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 he sustained injuries and um, he became a casualty. And that sent, you know, it, it, we actually put a bounty on his head you know, before we found him. And, and we used that to send a very stern note of warning to criminals in Ogun State that Ogun State, we are very clear about our vision. Our vision is to provide, you know, a, a, an environment that, 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 that supports, you know, public-private sector partnership. We believe that through that, by creating an enabling environment for a, a public-private sector partnership, our uh, people can be economically empowered. When people are economically empowered, it translates to individual prosperity. To do that, we must stamp out insecurity. So we do not have any room for crime or criminality of any guys in Ogun State. And I believe that last week's incident, I think that uh, is sent a note of warning. So in the area of security, we've invested well, we continue to invest. Our security trust fund is responsible for the welfare of the officers that you know, are parading our, uh, uh, the beat, responsible for even foiling them, maintaining the vehicle. So we have a pretty nice setup that I think we've put in place. And to ensure that it sustains the activity of our security architecture. I hope that answers your question. Well, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, on the petroleum side, uh, you know that this was my forte before I became governor. Um, and, and the truth is that um, it's difficult to eat our cake and have it. Um, the economy is going through a very serious contraction. Um, the government has decided in its wisdom to hands off um, pricing of petroleum products. Um, the industry is going through a deregulation at the moment, which means that pricing of petroleum products will be market driven. When the price of crude fell to almost $30, we enjoyed uh, retail pricing that was very, very low. Um, when the price of crude now rallies, uh, we'll expect that by the same token, um, we'll see that difference in petroleum prices. So, you know, we can't want to enjoy 
lower prices when the price of crude are low and then not want to pay for a slight increase when there's an increase in price of crude. So, I mean, because the price of crude is uh, uh, directly proportional to the price of refined products. So, um, I believe that um, that is what is happening at the moment. Um, um, in terms of um, the pricing of the, the tariff increase in the electricity industry, again, we also have to decide you know, what really we want to do. Um, we all complain that we are not generating enough electricity. Um, we all complain about the fact that uh, we don't have uh, the right uh, infrastructure to transmit electricity. We complain about the fact that um, the distribution companies do not seem to be efficient. But the problem is because perhaps maybe the pricing is not right. Um, if we want people to invest in, 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 in the production of gas, in gas transportation, which our turbines and our power plants rely on, we must ensure that the entire value chain uh, 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 is profitable because if one part of the value chain is not profitable, then that means that there will be a shortfall in one of the supply chains. So if they, we don't have enough investment in gas gathering, we don't have enough investment in gas transportation, we will not have enough gas supply to sustain the quantum of generation that we require as a government or as a nation. And when we don't have that, they will not, we don't have enough to, that will be transmitted you know, to, to, to our homes on transmission, on the transmission grid, and then we'll continue to complain. So really, the truth is that it's a catch-22 situation. Um, I, I believe that the government is doing NEC. I'm sure NEC is doing everything in his power to ensure that they kick in as a regulator. But truly, we must begin to ensure that we pay, you know, what we need to pay so that we can have the right amount of investment in the entire value chain of the electricity industry. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. I um, hope to see you again when I come. I will leave a copy of this big book for you. Uh, I'll leave it to your chairman.